Hey everyone, and welcome back to Suited Aces Poker, where every week we review hundreds of poker hands from vloggers across YouTube and bring you 10 of the best. In this week's episode, we've got Brad Owen attempting to crack through his own psychology. We've got a good lesson in sizing your bet to induce the right action. And at number one this week, we have a hand that I just can't get out of my head. How do you move on from that? All right, let's make a start. Number 10 this week and close to broke is at the Commerce Casino in California. He's in a 5-10 cash game. And after a hand like this, I think I'd feel pretty devastated if my opponent just racked up and left too. But for the very next hand, early position limps, the super slow, unbelievably tight player pre-flop, decides to limp in here. We look down at pocket queens. This is like unreal. From what was a pretty card dead session, we now are finding premiums back to back. Riding on that high from the last hand, I'm going to go ahead and isolate here to, c to continue playing and showing the aggression that I've been doing all along. It's even nicer to have a strong hand like this in my in my holdings right now. I make it $50, holds over back to the opponent, and he decides to re-raise me, surprisingly, to $250. I am totally incapable of seeing the white chips to the right of his stack. I think that he only has $1,000 but just shy of my eyesight, there's $700 that I don't see. So I think that I'm jamming here for $1,000. And in reality, I jammed for $1,700. Anyways, my opponent, you know, doesn't have much to think about. He thinks about it for like five seconds, makes the call. And we're going off to a flop that comes 10 high. The turn comes another 10. And by this point, I really let him know that his aces are good. He does, in fact, expose aces. We don't improve on the river. Unfortunate, we just won a massive pot i couldn't even put the chips away fast enough before i have to give it all away man i wish i could take that back it's just it's just so obvious when these things happen and it just sucks when it happens to me and the more tilting thing like literally this this very few things you know make me a little frustrated but this did he immediately racks up and leaves literally that that, that hand he played it racked up and left i was like damn that sucks at nine, and Alex Duval is at the Orleans in Vegas. He's playing in a 2-5 cash game. And let us know in the comments, are any of you finding a call on the river? Next up, I have ace seven of hearts and there is an under the gun limp for $5. Action folds to me on the button and I raise to $20. The small blind, big blind, and the under the gun limper make the call. The flop comes pretty great. Eight, six, five, two hearts. We flop an open-ended straight draw and the nut flush draw. With $80 in the pot, the big blind leads for $30. Under the gun folds and I don't really see much reason to raise here. I just make the call on the button. The small blind also calls. The turn comes the eight of diamonds. Not a great card considering the small blind or big blind could certainly have this is reinforced when the small blind leads for $65. This time the big blind folds and actions on me. No reason to raise, I just make the call once again. The river is the eight of hearts. With about $300 in the pot, we get there with the nut flush, but any pair makes a full house. My opponent once again bets, this time $100. This is a very small bet, leaving about $200 behind in his stack. Although I am getting a great price, I really just can't imagine what I'm beating here. Like I said, any pair is a full house, which of course beats my flush. My opponent also has a lot of 8x in their range, which would be quads. Old me might have just made the call here, but disciplined me makes the fold. And disciplined me is immediately punished as my opponent shows ace jack of spades. For whatever reason, they led the turn multi-way and come to find out from them, led the river to get me off an ace. Their shenanigans paid off this time more than they know. Number eight this week, and Huggy is playing at the lodge in Austin, Texas. He's in a 1-3 cash game, and this is a really good lesson in sizing your bet just right to induce the action that you want. 20 minutes later, we're dealt ace-10 offsuit in the plus one position. The first player folds and I raise it up to $15. The middle position player and the button both call and the three of us head to the flop. And it comes down five high with a pair of threes. It's a pretty good flop for us to see bet since it's not likely anyone connected here. I make it $30 and the player behind us folds. The next player who's in position on the button raises it up to 90. I think our opponent could be doing this in position with a pretty wide range of hands. He might have a small pocket pair, but he could also have air, considering he didn't 3-bet preflop. Our early position and betting pattern should look pretty strong if I continue putting on the pressure here, and I decide to do just that, 3-betting our opponent. 
In thinking through our C betting size, I feel like an ace high type hand, specifically ace king, would probably just shove here while a big pair would want to make a smaller raise hoping for a call. With that in mind, I decide to make a bit of a smaller bet to make it look like it's for value, raising to $240. Alright, let's go all in. It's a lot stronger now. 240? You went all in, I'd probably call. So our opponent folds, and our play worked exactly as I hoped it would, and we take it down. I show the bluff, hoping that we can get some action from the player when we've actually got a big hand later in the night. Number seven this week, and we're sticking with Huggy. He's still in that 1-3 cash game at the Lodge in Austin, and Huggy, oh man. Three hands later, this is the one you've been waiting for. We've got pocket kings in the plus two position. The first two players fold, and the player on the right limps in for $3. We're obviously raising it up here, and I bump it up to 20. It folds to the hijack, who three bets to 70. What a spot to be in. Everyone folds back to the limper who cold calls the three bet. There's no way we're not coming back over the top here, and after thinking on a bet size, I decided on $325 given the amount of interest. The hijack finds a call, and that apparently encourages the guy on our right to join as well, as he quickly puts in the chips to call. So we've got a massive $979 pot with kings, and we haven't even gotten to the flop yet. The flop comes down 4-7 queen with two clubs. Honestly, I'm not thrilled about the queen on the flop. With the hijack 3-betting preflop, then calling our large 4-bet, I think there's a chance we could be up against queens that just flopped a set. When the first player checks to us, I decide to put out a smallish bet making it $250 to see where we're at. Thankfully, it does not take long for the hijack to fold, and I feel a lot more comfortable about our holding. The player to our right, who originally limped in, thinks for a good minute or so before eventually pushing all in for $701 total. Seven even, I'm out. Seven and one. Seven and one. After getting a count, I realize. Yeah, I mean, I got a call. That's a call. Yeah. No more action. Swap a set. Fuck no, I'm about to draw. All right. Oh, I said. He flips up 8-6, meaning he had nothing but a gut shot with 8 high on the flop and somehow managed to spike his 4-outer on the turn. Ugh, I feel pretty disgusted here. Obviously our small bet made him think we missed and induced a bluff out of him while incredibly far behind. I'm feeling pretty flush in the face and a bit tilted at this run out to be totally honest. Number 6 this week and Ashley Sleaf is playing in a $1700 tournament at Bally's in Las Vegas. And this really has to be a dream situation. These really are the kind of people you want to sit down at your tournament table. Oh, and keep an eye out for the name on the table. Bally's has started its rebranding. So the table really gets spicy when this guy sits down, says that his friend bagged maybe chip lead or second in chips on day 1A, and he's basically competing with him because he wants to make more chips than him. And when I say that this guy was playing 100% of hands preflop, I mean it. He really never folded preflop. He either limped, raised you, he snap called if you three bet him. I mean, this guy was going off. It's like the perfect, perfect person to sit down at the table. Honestly, the strategy that everybody started taking was just nut pedal and hope that they catch him. He wasn't folding pre, was not folding on most flops, so you could at least get those two bets out of him. Here's an example, he had jack three suited against my friend's aces, doubled him up, and so we're just licking our chops and waiting our turn. While we did have to wait a little while, our time finally comes. I get the dream spot. I looked down at pocket aces under the gun one, and this guy is still going off. So I raised to 5,500. He might not have noticed. I haven't been opening since he sat down, but he three bets to 16K. He's only got about 105 total in his stack, which is 40 bigs. But I don't want to just rip it in with aces. I don't want to just call and have him, you know, see a flop that he doesn't like. So I just tiny four bet 
to 40K, which I could even go smaller maybe just as an exploit, but I chose 40K, two and a half times his bet. And he just snapped goals all in. And it was just music to my ears. I obviously put in the call immediately and he has pocket deuces. I hold post flop and I have no idea how I just ran this good, especially the guy that's just giving it away. And unfortunately for the rest of the table, we're the one to take the last of his chips. You can hear my neighbors and uh, their reaction to it. These next two hours are going to be real different now. Fun, yeah. <laughs> sorry, guys. There goes the fun. Sorry, I'm not sorry. <laughs> so, so your costs are going to be a lot smaller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Number five this week, and Brad Owen is playing in a huge 100-100 cash game in the Legends Room at Bellagio in Vegas. And after recent losing spots in big hands at the Lodge in Austin, can Brad break through his own psychology in this hand? I lose a $300 bomb pot before picking up ace-queen suited under the gun plus one. Under the gun raises to 300 with a $49,000 stack, I could call her 3-bet. I 3-bet to 800 to deter people from calling behind me and playing in position. Small Blind is a high stakes pro who's been on the vlog in the past. He knows that I don't normally play these stakes and puts in a cold 4-bet to 2600. If he's doing this for value, he's going to have hands that have me crushed like aces, kings, queens, and ace-king. He shouldn't really be bluffing over an under the gun raise than an under the gun plus one 3-bet, but maybe he occasionally is with a hand like ace-5 suited, perhaps something more creative. Under the gun folds, calling for 1800 more and playing an enormous pot with two cards that could be dominated doesn't sound too appealing. Ace-Queen suited is too strong to let go of in position though. I call, we're heads up in what's already developing into what could be a huge hand. The flop is Ace-9-3 with two clubs, we've got top pair. The action's on the small blind, I'm curious to see how he's going to play this. He bets 2500 it's just a slight down bet indicating that he's not afraid of the ace out there. No chance on ever folding. I call somewhat hoping that the opponent will slow down on the turn because a pair of aces with a queen kicker isn't that great in a four bet pot if money continues to pile in on future streets. The turn is the five of clubs. It's a really bad card because the primary holding that I expect the opponent to be bluffing me with just made two pair. The flush draw also gets there, but I'm not very concerned about that given that the ace is a club. If the nine was a club instead of the ace, I'd be way more worried that I'm drawing dead. The small blind continues with pressure and bets 5,000. I'm having flashbacks when I lost a $60,000 pot and got stacked during the last time that I played stakes nearly this big. Should I be folding here? You'd think the small blind would pump the brakes with a hand like kings, queens, or jacks. Ace-king seems like the most likely hand that I'd be up against given how this has been played and how many combos of ace-king are possible for the opponent to have. If I call, I'll have $8,600 in my stack and the pot will be over $20,000. I don't see how I'd be able to fold to a non-club river for that amount. If by some chance I'm not already in terrible shape, even if my opponent has one club in his hand, he's going to at minimum have quite a few outs. I'm terrified that I'm about to get wrecked. The small blind has shown tons of strength despite me being able to have some really strong hands on this board as well. I can't get myself to lay down top pair yet, even though there are only two cards in the deck that will make me feel any better. I call, making this already the largest pot that I've ever played at Bellagio. I'd like to see a non-club queen one time. The dealer puts out a miraculous queen of hearts, we smash it just when we need to. The small blind checks, if he has ace king here, I could get a massive double up. Part of me is wondering if I'm getting trapped by a set or a flush somehow. Should I check this back? What if I jam, get snap called, and lose almost an extra 9,000? I'll almost definitely get called by ace king and ace five, so I can't check back. I subdue the fear of worst case scenarios and announce, One. the opponent doesn't even think about it. He folds the moment my chip hits the felt. There's no way that he had ace-king or ace-five and likely didn't have an ace at all. He must have tried to pull some type of elaborate move on me with his pre-flop board bet coupled with his flop and turn bets. We were probably ahead the entire way as a huge pot even for this game comes our direction. Number four this week and Rampage, your boy Ethan is at Resorts World in Vegas playing in a 5-10. And I don't know, did Ethan manage to talk himself out of this one? Should he have listened to his gut? Would you? Even better, I pick up pocket queens on the button. There are two players who limp, and I raise to $140. Small blind folds, but then the big blind, the guy who covers me, he now three bets to $440. Everyone folds to me, and I have about 15000 in my stack now after chipping up big time, and certainly could four bet here. I think I should a lot of the time, but I've seen this player make some wild moves in the past, so I just decide to make the call. So we're going to a flop with a disguised strong hand. It comes jack-five-four rainbow. 
Here, he bets out $410 to start, and I have no decision other than just a call here. Really good spot for pocket queens, and I beat a lot of holdings. And the turn is the three of diamonds. He, once again, is not afraid and leads out for $1,200. And once again, I have an easy decision on just making the call. No need to raise and fold out his bluff that he could easily have. For $1,200, I'm in there. Pot is building. When the river is the seven of hearts, there's a four line on the board. Any six makes a straight, but that shouldn't really be too relevant. So here he is first to act and decides to do something ridiculous. Overbets the pot to $6,000 and I am in the blender. I think things over and initially, obviously, this should just be an easy snap call. And that's what my instinct is telling me to do. But I decided to think things over and... The more I think, the more I actually want to fold. When you think about population tendencies in live poker, it's really hard to find players who are willing to bet all three streets as bluffs, especially over betting as a bluff as well. So let's think about the hands that you can be three betting with and bluffing with, and it's only hands like ace king or ace five. I say it out loud because... That's it. Do I think he's going crazy with a pair or do I think he's going crazy with two over cards? Either do not sound that reasonable and he could easily have pocket jacks in this spot. I lose two kings and I lose to aces. And the more I think and the more I count out those combos, there are more combos that I lose to than I actually beat. So I don't know. Maybe I talked myself into a fold here, but I really want to and I actually end up letting it go. One of the other main decisions that I wanted to fold was if I call and I'm wrong, then I'm actually only up like $1,000 in the session and I'm up a really good amount as well. So maybe playing a little bit scared, wanting to lock up some profits, I fold face up after thinking about it for many, many minutes. And ultimately when I fold, he asks me if I wanna see the cards for the vlog. You wanna see it? Sure, that'd be good for, for the vlog. Yeah, I beat Ace. I beat Ace Five. Nice bet. Oh, God. <laughs> Gotta give credit. He had one of those hands that he was going crazy with and did. If I called, I would have won so much money, but I folded. So nice hand to this gentleman. Really ballsy bet by him on the river and got me to fold a hand that I basically never should have. Number three this week, and Jamin Burton is playing at the Rounders Card Club in San Antonio, Texas. He's in a $300 buy-in tournament, and... Donk. As the lines go up and effective stacks get shorter and shorter, play becomes a lot easier as post-flop dancing is extremely restricted, and pre-flop wars become the thing. Here the blinds are 20k, 40k with a 20k ante, and I raise to 110k off of about 850k. Action folds to the cutoff, and he decides to go with it. He shoves for slightly less, about 700k. At some point, you just have to gamble. You have to win a flip or two. So let's gamble. I call. Cards go on their backs, and he reveals Ace 7 of Hearts. Wow. I'm in much better shape than I thought. Well, that is until the ace, king, six flop. This is bad. Really bad. I'm pretty good at math, and by my calculations, there aren't many sevens left in this deck. The dealer burns and turns the seven of clubs. You have to be kidding me. A one-outer. We go ahead and fade the river and pull off a late stage double up. Number two this week and close to broke is at the Commerce in California playing in a 5-10 cash game. And this is some great analysis on a really quite unusual live tell. We look down at King 10 offsuit. I decide to raise from the cutoff to $35. The OMC slow roller on the button decides to make the call. We're going off to a flop that comes Ace, seven, three with two spades. The action starts off with me. I'm going to continue betting my entire range here. Half the size of the pot is what I end up betting for $35. I like to go maybe a little smaller, like a tad bit, you know, betting a catch all sizing, but I end up making it $35. My opponent pretty quickly calls and the turn card comes the eight of hearts. On this juncture, I'm going to continue telling the story that I'm representing an ace here, a strong one at that. So I end up betting $65. My opponent pretty quickly calls and ends up doing something that causes a little bit of pause in my head 
to think about something that I've seen in the past. My opponent calls and then pushes forward his chips as well as my chips, which usually indicates a couple of things. One, the pace of his call was really fast, which lends me to believe that he's fairly weak or at least drawing. And when an opponent pushes his chips, there is a chance this is not set in stone and this is not like white magic 100% of the time going to work. But usually that does signify weakness as well, or at least somebody trying to catch a draw. So if the river breaks out in any sense, if there's no straight draws that complete, if there's no flush draws that complete, I'm considering betting it even though I only have King High. The river comes a seven of clubs. As you guys can see, it pairs the second card, but it doesn't change a lot to the board dynamics. It also doesn't complete any straights or any flushes. So when the action's on to me, on this really boring card on the river, I'm going to bet $150 representing what is more likely my range going to be consisting of a pretty solid ace. Ace king, ace queen, ace shack would be very comfortable going for three barrels of value on this run out. My opponent thinks about it before ending up throwing his hand away. Pretty happy to get that through there. Not sure if he had a flush draw or whatever he had, but you know that life tilt seemed like it really came in handy there. And number one this week, taking the top spot. Lex Ozias, Lexo playing at the Seminole Casino down there in Coconut Creek, Florida. He's in a 5-10 cash game. And I watched this hand a long time ago this week, and I am still in shock. Lexo, <laughs> we do not know what to say about this one. Ugh. The player sitting next to me who has been making jokes and making the table super fun all night decides to buy a full round of drinks for the entire table and things start to get pretty crazy. With lime margarita flowing through my veins, we're ready to play some big pots. Nice and loosened up now with pocket kings. That is what I'm talking about. I make it $75 from middle position. The button makes to call who is a player who had been playing very tight. I think he's played about two hands in the last two hours. Under the gun makes a call as well. Three ways to queen nine three rainbow. When it checks to me, I bet $125 and the button snap raises me here to 500. This may seem like a great spot to be in. Getting raised with pocket kings on a queen high board and against a lot of other players, I would be feeling very good about my hand. But against this guy, he hadn't got out of line the entire night, played basically two hands. So when he raises here, he's saying he's got two pair or a set or maybe even pocket aces. I really hate doubling up people who don't play many hands, but can I ever fold pocket kings here? I don't think so. He's representing such a strong range of basically queen nine, pocket nines, and pocket queens. I think he would re-raise pocket queens pre-flop. So I call and we see the deuce of hearts on the turn, a total brick, doesn't change anything at all. I check over to him and he jams all in for $1,100. The way my opponent is playing this hand, he's saying he has a super strong hand and pocket kings are probably never good, but his bet timing did not make too much sense to me. On the flop, he snap raised me to $500. If he would have flopped a set on the flop, wouldn't he think about his bet sizing for a little bit longer? Maybe contemplate calling and slow playing or making it $300 or $400? Given the fact that he just snap raised to $500 seemed a little bit suspicious to me. And now on the turn when he snap shoves all in, for 1100 it just seems a little bit fishy, but would he ever do this with a straight draw? I mean, Jack-10 is the only draw here. Maybe he's got King-10, but we block that. He could possibly have Ace-Queen and think it's good. Maybe he flatted with Kings pre-flop, and he thinks those are good as well. After thinking for over a minute, I just think I cannot fold. If he's got me, he's got me. So, I make the call. I can't fold, I can't fold. King, okay, right? Twice. Whatever you want. Alright, twice. Two times? Yeah, yeah. Jack 10. He's Jack 10 of hearts. He's still Ace Queen of Hearts. Queen of Hearts. Jack 10 got there. Jack 10 got there twice. Oh my, oh my lord. Oh my what did I say? I told you Jack 10. And I had his out. Oh, oh my god. Oh, oh god. god. I mean, really. Running it twice and you lose to an eight both times? Oh, Lexo, we really feel for you. That's just disgusting. Man. Well, folks, that's it for another week. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It really does help the channel out a whole bunch. And if you want to check out any of the original content videos from any of this week's featured vloggers, you can find a link to that video in the description box below. 
do yourself a favor and head on over to one of those vloggers who you just don't know that well. Until next week, good luck of the felt.